This is a WFXR Sports special presentation. Tournament preview coverage. Welcome to Ticket to Texas. And welcome everybody to Ticket to Texas. I'm Jermaine Farrell. And I'm David DeGuzman. Houston and Dallas are the desired destinations for the UVA men and Virginia Tech women respectively. And over the next half hour, we'll be looking back at some of the memorable moments the month of March has already produced while looking ahead to the rest of the postseason for all our Southwest Virginia teams. And we begin with the women's NCAA tournament bracket. Well, Virginia Tech, they'll be the number one seed for the first time in program history. Now Tech, they are the number one seed in the Seattle three regional and in a major plot twist the selection committee pitting the Hokies against 16th seed Chattanooga now the mocks led by former Hokie assistant Sean Poppy that a winner of that first round game will face either USC or South Dakota State on Sunday and this was the scene in Blacksburg on selection Sunday when the brackets were released it'll be the first time that Castle Coliseum has hosted the women's NCAA basketball tournament since 2004 and home court advantage has proven to be tremendous this season. The Hokies with a 14 and one record in Blacksburg. Now the Virginia Tech women they entered the NCAA tournament with an 11 game winning streak. The Hokies making a splash on the national scene with their historic ACC tournament title. WFXR Sports Ryan Moy looks back at their memorable run in Greensboro. Exceeding expectations is something the Virginia Tech women's basketball team knows all about. These kids are motivated by a lot of different things. And, uh, you know, last year when we didn't get to finish the right way, um, we watched NC State win it. Um, you know, it, that fueled them. After defeating Louisville 75-67 to in their first ever ACC final, the Hokies were able to capture a title that for many was just a dream. We would come in high school, um, and, you know, we watched the Enrico Gumbawale, we watched Notre Dame, we watched Louisville win. Um, so for it to be us and for it to, for Virginia Tech to have champions next to it is incredible and I'm so happy that, you know, we've done this. We were going to win it from the start. We were saying we were going to win it and we just all had to believe and give every single ounce of effort. So that effort was just a huge factor. And honestly, the way that Taylor Soul played, the way that Deja Gregg played, was Kit Lee, Kayla King, Kayana Trailer, all of them, like, that is all MVP. Like, we're the best team, so equals out. <laughs> With another milestone added to the Hokies' long list of accomplishments, the momentum from this win will propel the program forward. It's awesome to have that banner and castle that's going to be there forever and remind me of it. Um, and yeah, it, it, I just can't like say enough about Coach Brooks and what he's done for this program and for me personally. Um, and it's just really awesome for everything that, oh my God, everything that we talked about to happen. Georgia! <laughs> It's so good for Virginia Tech and the women's program. Um, it's so good for Coach Brooks. He's my coach of the year. He always will be. Um, he's done so much for us, so much for the team. Um, and just, just look at the program. Like It's just on an upward trend, and I think this has just really solidified what he's doing um, and has solidified Virginia Tech as a legit contender, and I'm super proud of that because we deserve the respect. With all the players that have come through his program the past seven seasons, Virginia Tech head basketball coach Kenny Brooks says his message to them has always been the same. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say it's for everyone, uh, but these kids, if you buy into it and what we're doing and believe in it, um, things like this could happen. And uh, these kids have bought in. They understand it. Uh, their legacy will, will long live at Virginia Tech. Uh, we, we said it was going to be a special year, and, uh, and it's come to as the team prepares for the national stage, this moment of making history will live on forever in tournament and school history. We are live tonight in Dallas, Texas. We want to thank you for sticking with us for this special edition tonight. History in the making. We are talking our ticket to Texas. I'm Kathleen Stone. And I'm Jermaine Farrell. Kathleen, it's all about the first. The Virginia Tech Hogs want to keep the first going as an opportunity. They'll play LSU. Game will tip off in about 30 minutes. So it's a fun time for everyone. Hokie Nation is in the house as Virginia Tech trying to get something done here. Now, your number one seed at Virginia Tech Hokies are facing off tonight against the number two seed and actually the number three seed LSU Tigers. Now, the Hokies going for a collective 31 and four the season with all four of those losses coming in conference play. But Virginia Tech has been on a hot streak. They are like hot like Oval Redenbacher, hoping to keep a now 15 game win streak going. Tigers faring slightly better with a 32 and two record. And it's the first trip 
to the Final Four for Virginia Tech, but the Tigers are no strangers to the big dance. This will be LSU's team's sixth trip to the semifinals, but their first since 2008. And the winner will go on to face the winner of South Carolina and Iowa in that matchup for the championship. That game is set for. Hardy's Friday Night Blitz is sponsored by Hardy's, Don Hudson Insurance, Muckadoos, Wicked Diesel, and by Academy Sports and Outdoors. Ah, yes. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jermaine Farrell, hoping your day is wonderful and blessed. Welcome to Hardy's Friday Night Blitz, week two of the high school football season, and we're going to kick the action off with our game of the week. Now, the Hardy's Friday Night Blitz game of the week, sponsored by Don Hudson Insurance. A Hardy's Friday Night Blitz game of the week for week two takes us to City Stadium in Lynchburg as the Patrick Henry Patriots for the second straight week to hit the road to the Lynchburg area to play a Seminole District foe in the E.C. Glass Hilltoppers. This is the first meeting between the two teams since 2008. Both teams looking to go 2-0 and on the season. City Stadium, the place to be in this matchup. It was a good one. We go to the first quarter. Patrick Henry able to get in the scoring position. Chuck Webb is going to tote the mail into the zone. Touchdown. Patriots go on top seven to nothing. To the second quarter, pH up 10 nothing. Easy class. Jamari on Kittrell passes to Jertavius Osborne down the sideline into your living room. He's got it. Touchdown. Glass cuts the lead to 10 to seven. But pH would come back. Joey Beasley with Quali Carter. KC, are you with me? Oh, yeah, with the bump. He's going to take it to the house, one in the program and in your heart. Touchdown, PH goes up 17 to 7, but Glass gets back on offense. How about Cottrell is going to go to the air, hook up with Jamar Smith with the aerial attack at City Stadium. He's going to take it all the way to the house. Touchdown, Glass cuts the lead to three at 17-14. But a few plays later, he is Chuck Webb, the CW. Not only is our sister station, but he's the running back. Takes it in. 24 to 14 pH at recess. And the Patriots, they go to 2 0 on the year with a 31 21 win over the Hilltoppers. Ryan Moy has a wrap up on the game from Lynchburg. Well, for the first time in 15 years and the second time in two weeks, the Patrick Henry football team, well, they came to Lynchburg and they handled business, thanks in large part to their offensive onslaught in the first half of the game. Yeah, I mean, this is the first time I've ever been to City Stadium. You know, we haven't played them. We haven't played them since I've been here. They've got a really good football team. So it's a, a, a great win for us, and we, uh, we're excited about it. It means a lot. You know, this is the first time I've ever played them. We knew they were going to be dogs. Came out here, we executed, and that's what I like about my team. Yeah, like I said, they've got a really good program, really good football team. So to come here and win is, is huge for us. Uh, we all have great team chemistry. We've been playing for years. And, I mean, I, I believe we have the talent to do it. I mean, going to, going to practice every week, you know, practicing hard we still got stuff to prove we're not we really haven't done nothing yet well the Patriots are now undefeated they're 2 and 0 overall they defeat EC glass 31 to 21 right here at Lynchburg City Stadium in Lynchburg Ryan Moy WFXR Sports thank you so much Ryan for the second week Albemarle out of the Charlottesville area host one of our local schools and William Fleming Colonels we go midway through the first quarter Fleming going to the air just here Preston to Omarza, great. OG, he's an OG. 35 yard score. Colonel's up seven to nothing. It's now nine to seven. Alvin Morrow and Davion Faulkner gets it into the zone, breaking a couple of tackles there. Fleming would go for two and they would get it eventually, but the Colonels, they're 2 0 on a year with a 15 to 9 win over Albemarle. Meanwhile, a special visitor at tonight's Franklin County Salem game at Salem Stadium, the aerial attack because guess who's in the house? Right there in the helicopter. There he is, yes, Virginia Tech head football coach Brent Pry making an appearance via the helicopter to check out some Friday night lights. 
He would like what he see from Salem here. Eli Taylor to Peyton Lewis breaking a few scores there. He gets it into the zone. Seven nothing Salem. More Salem. Lewis from the seven gets a seven. Touchdown. Salem up 14 nothing. And then double J for Salem. Javion Jones, the Michael Jordan number. 23 yards, breaking tackles. He is a bad man. 21 nothing Salem. The Spartans bounce back to hand the Eagles their first loss. 48 to 7. We're off to Amherst County where the Lancers opening up the season at the crib against the George Washington Eagles. GW would get on the board first. Nia Maya Cabell or Cabell sneaks it in for the score. 6 0 Eagles after the Miss PA2. Yeah, there's Yoda. Thank you very much, ma'am. Anyway, how about this? Elijah Bridges, he gets it into the zone. GW with a 12 0 lead, but back comes Amherst. Tress Ligon is going to run to the outside, going to the outside, going to the outside. Touchdown. The Eagles leaves cut to 12 to 7 and Amherst comes back to win Chris Moore's debut. Lancers head coach with a 26 to 20 win. A battle in Bedford County, Manita. The Stan River Golden Eagles taking on the Jefferson Forest Cavaliers. Defense was the name of the game early and often. Case in point, the Cavaliers getting stops like this from Junior D Lyman Wrigley Colling chewing some gum there. He stops Stanton's Macon Ayers on the loss. And the Stanton River fans were well, actually JF fans. They were in camo. Meanwhile, not in camo, but decked out like this. How about this play here? Damien Williams with the pitch. He's going in there for 37 yards. Jefferson Forest, they go on to win this one, 27 to 15, to go to 2 and 0 on the season. Coming up, we have more Friday Night Blitz action. Hardy style, week two. David Guzman joins us with highlights from Bogle Stadium, where K Spring looking to go 2 and 0, hosting Northside. Stick and stay, please. Now, Hardy's Friday Night Blitz Band of the Week. And now, back to the Hardy's Friday Night Blitz on WFXR. And hey, welcome back, good peeps, to the Hardy's Friday Night Blitz. David de Guzman in the house. David de Guzman, I tell you one thing, you got a little taste of Roanoke County. A couple of big games, but your first stop, Bogle Stadium, for a long time, Roanoke County battle. Yeah, that's right, Jermaine. Cave Spring hosting Northside in week number two. The Knights coming off a pretty emphatic victory over Western Albemarle in the opener, 42 to 3, while Northside. Still looking for its first win in nearly two years, trying to snap a 13 game losing streak. But first, a special moment before the game to honor the late Kip Nininger, a Cave Spring student athlete who died in a car crash in 2021. His dad, Chris, presenting Knights wide receiver Owen Sweeney with a scholarship in Kip's honor, ensuring the memory of the two time state wrestling champion will never be forgotten. The Vikings making a big statement early in this game. Angel Rigney, who, by the way, has a tattoo of Kip Nininger on his left forearm. Here he is with a huge throw to Mikkel Harvey. The 31-yard touchdown score on fourth down. And just like that, Northside is on the board first. And then in the second quarter, the Knights able to level the playing field. Andrew Browning punching it in from about a yard out. We are tied at seven with five minutes left until the half, but a lot can happen in five minutes. Here's Rigney again, another long throw and long live the King Christopher King with the reception in the end zone for the go ahead touchdown. Vikings lead 14 to seven with about 20 seconds to go. You would think that's how the half ends, but then on the kickoff, Amari and Tolliver can't secure the ball for the Knights and somehow the Vikings recover. They've got a chance to extend the lead before the break, and that's exactly what Northside does. Dakota Kelly with the touchdown reception, giving Northside a 20 to 7 lead at the break, and the Vikings go on to win 30 to 27 for their first win since October 29th, 2021. All right, now to Bob Patterson Stadium in Vinton, William Bird hosting Hidden Valley, and the William Bird Marching Band Flag Girls in the spotlight. Terriers Israel Harrison doing what he does best, controlling the game on defense and offense, gets a pick on the first play of the second half, returns it inside the Hidden Valley 10. And the home crowd loving it, knocking at the doorstep. Two plays later, Harrison finishes the job. 
taking it in from the one yard line that puts bird up 28 to seven and still not done. You're about to see a defensive lineman's dream come true. Braden Moore wanting to go downfield, but he's intercepted by Jonathan Roster and Maurice Burnett finishing the job as the big guy rambles 20 yards for the score. 35 to seven at that point. Bird going on at 2 and 0 with a 47 to 7 win over the Titans. Seems like Jermaine, we got two teams that started from the bottom not too long ago and now they are here. Bird went winless two seasons ago and then the Terriers are off to their first 2 and 0 start since 2018. And next up, Brad Lutz's squad facing Christiansburg, a tall order there. That's a team that went all the way to the state semifinals a season ago. Jermaine. David, thank you so much. First last week was Taylor Swift. Now you busting out the hip hop game. Nicely done, sir. Well, anyway, it's a battle for the lantern in Appomattox. The Raiders hosting the Rustburg Red Devils are both teams coming off of opening wins. Now last year, Rustburg ended a six game losing streak to the Raiders, winning in 2022 27 to 20 in Rustburg. So let's go to Bragg Stadium and the Raider cheerleaders. They were fired up like everybody else. And speaking of getting fired up with Demonte Fleshman with a nice TD run into the living room. That's a touchdown 7 nothing Appomattox and the Red Devils with Respondo. Marshawn Rosser takes it in for the score, cutting the lead to 7 to 6 after the missed kick and then more Rosser running hard. That's a touchdown, making it 14 to 7 Rustburg and the Red Devils are 2 and 0 in a year with a 22 to 7 win over Appomattox. Meanwhile, we had Hardy's Friday Night Blitz action last night. Carroll County Cavaliers hosting the Grayson Blue Devils. The first quarter was scoreless, but then getting the offense going. How about Austin Dow to Keyshawn Fitz? Gets it in around the 20, but the drive would stall. Then with 32 seconds left in the half, Grayson County back on the O. Aaron Peterson, he's going to get brought down in a big way at the two. But three seconds later, guess what AP is going to do all day? Touchdown gets it in there. The Blue Devils go up six to nothing at the half and Grayson County would go on and get the W last night 12 to seven over Carroll County. Coming up, we are first with your scores and highlights with the Friday Night Blitz. We have our last batch of highlights. Plus, we go to the New River Valley where Ryan Moy has our first player of the week of the season. And now, Hardy's Friday Night Blitz, Hardy's Fan Cam, sponsored by Hardy's. This is a WFXR Sports Special presentation. Welcome to the Commonwealth Bowl Blitz. And hello and welcome to the 2023 edition of Commonwealth Bowl Blitz. I'm David de Guzman. And I'm Jermaine Farrell. And over the next half hour, we're going to talk about one of the busiest bowl seasons the state of Virginia has seen in years. Four different schools, David, to talk about, plus the return of the Stag Bowl to Salem. And we're going to start, though, with Liberty. The Flames getting ready to appear in the Fiesta Bowl on New Year's Day after a perfect regular season, followed by a Conference USA Championship. All of this in Jamie Chadwell's first year as head coach in Lynchburg. Now LU has a date with Oregon in Glendale, Arizona. And WFXR's Ryan Moy looks back at the Flames' historic campaign. They have the opportunity to take this football program to the next level in Conference USA to compete for conference championships starting in 2024, start competing, start competing for the CFP. Words spoken into existence just a year ago by Liberty University head football coach Jamie Chadwell. A year later, the Flames finished the season with an undefeated record, a Conference USA title, and also earned their first ever New Year's Six Bowl invite. To say this season under first year head coach Jamie Chadwell has been anything but special is truly an understatement. He didn't know if it was not going, you know, if it was going to happen or not. Um, I mean, there was just uh, exhilaration. There was there was um, joy. Uh, there was emotions, you know, tear because of uh, where you come from, right? I think when you when you when you come from smaller levels and you don't necessarily even think you have the opportunity to do something like this, and you, and uh, it opens up and you get that opportunity. Um, just a special you know, moment. Even with all the accolades that came with being ranked the number 18th team in the nation to now facing Oregon in the Fiesta Bowl. But for Coach Chadwell, it was about facing adversity right here on campus that reignited his team's bond. We went through uh, a challenging time in fall camp uh, where we lost one of our, our young men offensive linemen the fourth day of practice. Uh, and um, that that going through, going through his death uh, really brought this group together because uh, I think they realized 
how special it is to be with a group of people and all pushing toward a common goal. And and, and when we lost uh, Taj there, it, it, I don't say it woke everybody up, but I think they realized they were in this together. Although the journey through this season has been filled with many obstacles on and off the field, Coach Chadwell knows his flames will continue to rise. Reporting from Lynchburg, Ryan Moy, WFXR Sports. And Liberty's bowl history may be short, but it's a winning history nonetheless. Former Flames head coach Hugh Freeze led LU to three straight bowl wins, including back-to-back -back victories at the Cure Bowl. The 2020 win happened to be against now current Liberty head coach Jamie Chadwell when he was at the helm of Coastal Carolina. Liberty's last bowl victory was in 2021 in the Lending Tree Bowl over Eastern Michigan. Last year, the Flames lost to Toledo in the Boca Raton Bowl. Well, meanwhile, for the Virginia Tech Hokies, it was a season that had more twists and turns than a roller coaster ride at an amusement park. So let's check out the Hokie season. Now, the Hokies opened up the year with a win at home over ODU. Then they dropped their next three to go one and three. Tech then got on a roll, winning three of their next four games, highlighted with a three wins to even their home with a record at four and four. And they needed two wins to become bowl eligible. And that is what the Hokies did. Wrapping up the season with a 55 to 17 win at Virginia in the Commonwealth Clash. Now the emergence of Kyron Jones as quarterback helped them with the run to the Military Bowl. And Virginia Tech finished tied for fourth in the ACC with a five and three mark. Yeah, I mean the excitement and the momentum is also particularly the way we got bowl eligible. Um, you know, I think everybody in the program feels like that we're moving the needle in the right direction. There's a lot of things that we obviously have to improve on, but doing some good things. Now the Hokies, they take on Tulane in the Military Bowl on Wednesday, December 27th at 2 from Annapolis, Maryland. Now here's Virginia Tech's bowl history. This is their 35th bowl appearance. Tech, they are 13 and 21 in bowl games. This is the Hokies' third trip to the Military Bowl. Now Virginia Tech beat Cincinnati 33-17 in the 2014 Military Bowl. But since he would beat the Hokies 35-31 in the 2018 Military Bowl, Virginia Tech, they're trying to end a four-game losing streak in those bowl games. Well, one of the grand traditions synonymous with Virginia Tech football is, of course, enter Sandman when the Hokies take the field. But during that time, another special and more subtle tradition happens at the 30-yard line, a moment that honors our country and our military and the Corps cadets playing an important role. As the fans begin jumping to enter Sandman and the players prepare to take the field, three cadets are receiving their final instructions. 66,000 people on their feet, uh, the, the cheerleaders, the music, I mean, all the pageantry of college football is right there in that moment. So those football players coming out, you know, they're on adrenaline and they're hyped up. And so, uh, yes, we want to make sure that there's a good clean handoff uh, with the cadets. It's a simple task known as flag duty but one that makes a tremendous impact. That handoff of the flags just kind of shows that connection and that tradition that goes back many, many decades. It really tied the football team and the core of cadets and that, you know, what it means to be a Hokie. Um, they work hard, leadership, teamwork, selfless service, excellence. It's the same principles that they're pursuing on the football team as we're pursuing in the core of cadets. The moment reserved for cadets who have earned the honor. Individual cadets chosen based on merit within the Corps. First year cadets getting the opportunity for home games, while flag duty at away games and bowl games are reserved for upperclassmen. And the select few that take the flag come away with more than a lifelong memory. I think it's really meaningful, especially like so because you see uh, uh, like kind of like a teaming up between the football team and the cadets. And like, especially before the game, you see the uh, they'll make an announcement that this is a uh, core of cadets of the year 2023 and everyone just starts cheering and that just like shows that there's a big support of the military here at Virginia Tech. All right, now later in the show, we check in on a Virginia Tech Hall of Fame player and Eddie Royal as he makes his mark in sports broadcasting. Well, now we turn our attention to the James Madison Dukes after a highly publicized fight to play in postseason, David. JMU is headed to a bowl game. That is right. The Dukes, twice a national champion at the FCS level, 
just about to complete their two year transition to FBS football. The Dukes nearly going undefeated. They won their first 10 games of the season, which included victories over Commonwealth opponents like the University of Virginia and Old Dominion. James Madison also getting the national spotlight on college game day, only to lose that same day to App State, the Dukes only loss of the year. After going 11 and 1, JMU earning a spot in the Armed Forces Bowl, but it will take the field without Kurt Signetti, who resigned to take the head coaching position at Indiana. Instead, the Dukes will take the field with offensive line coach Damien Robluski serving as the acting head coach on Saturday. I think at the end of the day, the, the most important thing is that this is the first bowl game in James Madison history. And this is the last time that this team's ever going to play. Whatever happens after this happens, that's not of our concern, that's out of our control. we got to focus on what we can control, and our control is our preparation leading up to the game, and then squeezing every ounce of, of enjoyment and brotherhood together as we go through this bowl week together. The Armed Forces Bowl set to kick off in Fort Worth, Texas, 3.30 on Saturday afternoon. And Coach Robo, certainly not the first interim head coach looking to lead his team to a win. Go back to 2014, Shane Beamer stepping in for his dad, Frank, as legendary head coach recovered from throat surgery. Virginia Tech beat Cincinnati that year. Then in 2021, J.C. Price at the helm for the Hokies after Justin Fuente was let go. Tech lost to Maryland at the Pinstripe Bowl. Then last year, Josh Aldridge serving as the acting head coach for Liberty after Hugh Freeze departed for Auburn. The Flames fell to Toledo in the Boca Raton Bowl. Well, coming up after the break, we'll sit down with one of JMU's one-on-one -on -one action with JMU outgoing athletic director Jeff Bourne. The Salem name reflects on 25 years in Harrisonburg as the Dukes get set to make history. And now, back to the Commonwealth Bowl Blitz. I'm not here to knock down a program and build it up from scratch. You don't need that, right? You have an unbelievable football program here, right? I am here to advance it and accelerate it, right? I'm here to add to it and not slow this down in any which way. And I express that to the team. There's a lot of unbelievably great things going on on that field that are going to continue to go on, right? At the same point in time, there's some things that I think that I could help with to take us to that next level. And I'm excited to put that into place. I want to win championships. You want to win championships. And we will do that together. And that's Bob Chesney, former Holy Cross head coach, who is set to take over the James Madison program after this weekend's bowl game. Now, Chesney, he brings 14 years of head coaching experience to Harrisonburg. Now, welcome back to the Commonwealth Bowl Blix. Chesney is the latest hire by athletic director Jeff Bourne, who will get to see James Madison take the field in the Armed Forces Bowl. Now, David, they're completing a two-year transition from FBS football, from FCS football to FBS football. Seems like a long two years. I sat down with the Salem native, Jeff Bourne, who's about to retire at the end of the year. He says Saturday's game will be the pinnacle of a journey that began when he took the job 25 years ago. To me, the biggest thing is that all the the individual threads in this rug have come together to pull in the right direction to make some incredible things happen. That's the one thing I think that stands uh, about JMU that's so important is the continuity, uh, the common voice and the culture that we've grown. And it makes it a special place that people want to be a part of. And um, I tell everybody, you cannot understand that unless you come here. If you come here and you witness it, and you see it, you'll then believe it. So it is it is a truly unique, special place. You sure aren't going quietly because there's just been so much that's happened in this past year. One of those things that did happen this year was kind of the whole fight for postseason eligibility. Is there anything you would have done differently when you look back on that at all? Probably not. I mean, we worked incredibly hard uh, over the last two years, uh, anticipating that it was going to be an uphill swim, but I, I guess looking back on it, I felt like there would be a better um, objective view taken. Some common sense would prevail in that. Although having dealt with NCA now over a number of years, I should have known better. You know, they talk about always leave a place better than you found it. What's the legacy that you hope you leave behind here? <sighs> And I would, I would hope that people would look back and say, um, this guy really cares about people and he cares about relationships. 
and he really wanted to help student athletes and professionals succeed. I think, I think higher education is very unique in that standpoint. It offers the future of a dream. And to me, I got the dream. And that's what's really special.